recognize the presence of um, the former Minister of Aviation, Chief Osita Chidoka, Iko Bosi. Um, I want to give him the opportunity now to speak since we cannot hear myself. Iko Bosi, you have the floor. Thank you very much and welcome. Um, thank you very much. Um, Mazazuke. Mazazuke. And um, everybody here. Um, first, I would have loved to hear Mazazuke's <coughs> presentation. He was looking to me like he was going to be dealing uh, with some issues that all of us have been thinking about if Nigeria is a peculiar case. Um, so hopefully before the end of this conversation, we're going to hear um, him. But going straight to the question that was asked, um, there was a vital question we asked for this presentation. Where are our governors? What is the Southeast doing about this? And um, how are we handling this situation that is uh, upon us now? Um, one of the most important things for me in this conversation is the fact that uh, one of the most important things for me is that it is a crisis and we can turn it into opportunity. Um, turning this crisis into opportunity will require that we think in a more localized way. Nigeria is a very vast country and um, you can't find a solution that cuts across. So let me give an instance. We have three major airports. Let me start from my aviation background. We have three major airports in Nigeria for influx of aircrafts. So we have Lagos, we have Port Harcourt, and we have Kanu, Abuja. The government has closed all international airports, but they've left Lagos and Abuja open. So all the goods coming in from China now, test kits, um, PPEs coming from China, lands in Lagos and in Abuja. The governor of River State have said he doesn't want aircrafts coming to Port Harcourt. So they are very happy to do that because what that means is that in the absence of testing kits, you can share it in the southwest, you can share it in the north from Abuja. There is no vehicular movement between the north and the south. Southeast and the south south, we are losing out on the Chinese products coming in for the country for test kits. So it is important that we think strategically in managing this crisis. Uh, we need the airport in Portugal to be open. I've tried to reach out to the River State Governor for light concerning essential materials and logistics. Now, the hub of logistics in Nigeria is Igbo transporters, and the transport industry has been brought to a halt. If you come to the U.S., the biggest beneficiary of this crisis is Amazon. Amazon stock prices have gone up because Amazon is the backbone that is supporting all um, distribution now. So we need to, again, think about the logistics of moving things and people at this time. We need to get back our government, our Southeast government, to open up for those vehicles that are moving um, valuable essentials to keep moving. All this announcement of closing state border, closing state boundary, um, sometimes is simply idiotic. Now, there is also the food dimension. All the yam that you eat in, in rivers, in Nadia, in Imo, in Enugu, come from Benue and Taraba. So if you close Ninth Mile, you are blocking out food coming in from the northeast um, down to the southeast. So again, we need to think about it. More importantly, I think that some of the responsibilities of Nigerian states have come back to haunt us. The fact that the Nigerian states, which have the responsibility for collecting income taxes, do not collect income taxes widely, means that there is no way for them to give out palliatives to people. Exactly. The only people paying income taxes are civil servants and those in formal employment. So they really don't need the money. The people that need the money are those that are not in formal um, employment. So the fact that in the tax net of states like Anambra, you have 200 and something thousand people in a population of 4 million. Um, in states like Imo, you have about 300,000 people who filed their last taxes predominantly civil servants and public servants from the federal government. So we as the South is the governors of the South East have to go back to the basics. This crisis has taught us one big lesson, that we cannot build skyscrapers on top of mud. So we have to go back on to the basics. And what are these basics? The basics is that people in, in Canada, people in America, in Germany, are receiving checks from their government because there is a two-way communication through the tax returns 
for which to verify citizens. Secondly, we need to also understand the importance of having data. How many hospitals do we have in the Southeast? How many hospital beds are available for us in the Southeast? How many have ICU um, units in the Southeast? How many doctors in the Southeast are able to help in the matter we can be mobilized in this um, crisis? Because don't forget, most of what you see in the Southeast today, most of the doctors operating in Nigeria are of Southeastern region and South South region. So we need to figure out where are they located and how are we going to be able to utilize them. So my major point is that the, where are our governors? Our governors are absent because they are incapacitated. The Abuja money has weakened state capacity. The money we collect from Abuja every month has made it difficult for our states to perform basic functions. And one of those three basic functions I've identified in the last few days online. First, we need to have the capacity to collect personal income tax. How people fight. It doesn't matter how much they are paying. The matter is not how much they are paying. The important thing is that every adult citizen has to have a tax ID through which the government can get back to that citizen. Secondly, we have to have all our houses, cities, maps, and houses, streets named and numbered. It is critical for you to use as a matter of course to talk about households and how to relate to those households. Third one, we need to have a death and death register of those who have died and those who have been born so that the state can tell you with certainty, this is where our populations are. This is how our populations are trending. This is how our people are moving. Now, this crisis has offered us an opportunity for our governors to come back. The restructuring that we're talking about, you can restructure inefficiencies. So when there are inefficiencies, whether you're in small latitude, you will only be restructuring inefficiencies. It will come down to hunt all of us. So we need to get our governments in the Southeast yeah. to come back to the right, basic purpose of government. The purpose mm -hmm. of government is not security vote. The purpose of government Sorry? is not the sharing of stomach yeah, infrastructure. Yeah, the purpose of government is no, not in awarding to. contracts okay. for building of mm -hmm. roads. The purpose of government is to be the interlocutor, to be that organizing philosophy that makes it possible for the interplay of forces to be managed. So one of the reasons why I think this conversation is critical for all of us in the Southeast and for all of us who are here today is to say that our sentiments, our thinking of Nigeria should come back to our, going back to our states and performing the basic functions of state. Those basic functions are critical in times of crisis. That is what you build on to be able to manage those crises. You cannot build on, on um, you cannot start using what you haven't built on. It's like you haven't done exercise before and you want to run a marathon. It can happen on the day of the marathon. You have to have planned and you must have exercised for long enough to be able to run a marathon. So on a final note from me, I think that this is a very important conversation and we need to cascade it to understanding that the biggest restructuring, the biggest referendum we can have as a people is to go back to our government and understand the purpose of government. The purpose is not security vote, and it is not in the distribution of lajis from Abuja. Thank you very much. So, thank you very much, um, you know, uh, Chief um, Osita Chidoka. You know, very um, aptly put and excellently uh, marshaled out. Now, before I, you know, let us um, have questions, the question for me will be uh, regarding the issue of um, river states and um, and yes, you know, and the federal government. From your, you've been an uh, aviation minister before. Yes, and we clearly said that he has the right. I mean, there is issue of jurisdiction here. Who has the right to fly in, into Port um, You know, whether the federal government can actually allow people to fly in or are they just that we can do anything or is federal government right actually to allow for that flight that came into Port Harcourt that led to that conversation is federal government right to do that or is we basically bragging for bragging's sake well i must say that aviation is on the exclusive list of nigeria so the governor cannot 
um, the airports, you can even build your own airport today. The moment you finish constructing it, it becomes only the federal government can give you the power for aircraft to come in there. So internationally, um, Nigeria is recognized as a country in ICAO, the ICAO, and the reason for that is that um, all the rules pertaining to aviation is on the exclusive list of every country. We, we deal with countries and not sub-national governments. But what is critical here is that this is not the time for this debate. This is the time for us to clarify issues mm -hmm. and see how we can solve a crisis. We're in the middle of a war. A house is burning. And you are questioning which fire service is allowed to turn off the fire. Exactly. We cannot be turning off the fire. We cannot debate about who can turn off the fire now. Fire we need to put turn. off the fire. Exactly. So for me, what the governor of River State have to understand is that, yes, you cannot allow people to private aircrafts and commercial flights to come. But flights that are bringing essential services, flights that governments have authorized to come. In fact, the government of the Southeast and South South should actually ask the federal government to open it up immediately because that's the only way they can distribute materials between these contiguous states. Mm. There is no way to drive from Lagos all the way to Enugu now to bring in materials that are being distributed in Lagos. Rather, they are distributing it within the Southwest. From Abuja, they are distributing it within the North. There is no way to drive from Abuja now to Port Harcourt. So, and my own attitude now is that the debate about what, who controls what, we can have it after this event. But now, is that we seem not to understand the magnitude of the problem before us. So the problem before us is that we have an existential crisis and we need to pull all our eggs. We need to get all our boats aligned in one direction. And that is critical. Okay, thank you very much. I can see that Daniel Elumba has raised his hand. Uh, Dan, do you have a question? Uh, um, yes. My question is with regards to... Uh, Professor Chukuma Soludo's article today. I don't know whether some of us read it. Mm. It is just as beautiful as what uh, Chief Wester Chidoka has just given us now. Yeah. Uh, but Professor Soludo was kind of of the opinion that African countries cannot afford a lockdown at the moment. Mm. Um, in the UK, there is an argument, a debate going on now as to whether what is our priority? Is it to preserve life or to allow economic activities to continue? So the UK is now trying to see where do we strike a balance between having a lockdown to preserve more life and then at the end of the day, how does it affect our economic activities? My question to Chief Osa Chidoka is this, please. Do you think that the Nigerian government and our governors in general who has implemented this lockdown do you think that adequate consideration has been given to the issue of how do we maintain a balance between preserving life and allowing economic activities to continue? And if they have not, where do you think the balance lies? How do we how do we strike that balance? You know, well, that's to say, how do we strike that balance between helping our people to maintain social distancing so that these uh, coronavirus, we will be able to delay its transmission or even minimize the death. And also, when people are saying, well, people are dying of hunger as well. Uh, one person wrote an article saying, I'm more in, I'm, one woman said, I'm more interested in stop, not dying from hunger than not dying from COVID-19. So where do you think the balance lies? How do we handle this issue, please? Okay, Dan, thank you very much for the first. Sorry, uh, Esther, before you, continue, before you go, I want to take another question from Obio Suji so that you can answer the two questions at once. Okay. Okay, it's over to you. No, it's okay. It's uh, it's okay. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. So go ahead and answer, ask your question so that he can take the two questions at once. Uh, well, um, Basti, first, I was going to ask whether you had forgotten that I did a presentation or not. No, I am. Uh, I, I have you here, but let's finish with the question. Then we'll get to the uh, to the next uh, person who will present. Okay. Now, what, what ask? Um, Chief uh, Osita, and I, I didn't get from him is now where do we want to situate the issue of testing? Because it's like we're kind of glossing over uh, the reality of COVID. The Southeast keeps on recording low numbers, and as well as the South South. What should we be doing about testing? Where does testing come into all this fray? That's the principal thing I want to. I want because I think COVID is the issue here. 
and to some extent whatever we want to come up with whatever practical solutions we want to think has to also stem from the reality of the problem of covid i don't know if you got that clear yes well yes okay so um starting from the last issue uh, the issue here is covid and the issue of covid is multifaceted and multidimensional the inability to test is linked to the inability of governments to have access to testing equipment. The inability to have access to testing equipment is linked to the fact that we have brought on ourselves to a lockdown. So we are going to be discussing the issue of COVID. What is happening in other countries is that governments have, have risen to the occasion. Now, taking it to Soludo's point of view, um, I had a lot of conversations with him before now and about how the lockdown is not necessary. And I'm happy he took this position um, on the lockdown, clarifying that it's not sustainable. I don't think it's sustainable. But I've also learned a few new things listening to the regular briefings from the White House. Um, Dr. Fauci, um, the doctor in charge of, I don't know what is in charge of, the NCDC here, the CDC here, made a very important point. He said, number one, we don't understand this virus. Number two, this is the first virus that we are seeing that you can transmit. Being asymptomatic, you can transmit it. Secondly, it's the same virus that we see that you can distribute through surfaces. So the fact that you touch the surface now and somebody comes back in one hour to touch the same surface can transmit the disease, the virus. So because we don't understand it, that is part of the reasons why the lockdown is like a first reaction. It is not the solution but it's a solution to first of all understand the virus. So I think that we will all be careful, uh, we will all be more tentative in our views as we go on. Whether we can afford a lockdown is as also as important as whether we can afford one million people being sick and needing respiratory um, equipment. It's also the same question about whether we can afford 5 million people being sick, whether we can afford 100,000 people dying. These are all part of the moving path, we know. But I think that in the last three weeks, a lot has become known about the virus and more will be known over the next one or two weeks. So what we need to do is to start a phrase I have coined. I call it restart without spreading. How do we restart without spreading? And how to restart without spreading goes back to the issue of testing. We need to have massive testing going on. Because that way, we can begin to talk about restarting without spreading. We cannot talk about just restarting the economy for the restarting sake. Um, if we just restart, um, we don't know what is going to happen. I only have one hope. I think that the Nigerian, and Nigerians generally, may be more attuned to handle the symptoms of COVID better than the Europeans and the Americans are handling it. We already suffer from a lot of malaria, fever, and you know flu in nigeria people go and buy over the counter anti-malaria drugs buy over the counter anti-typhoid drugs so we're already consuming a lot of antibiotics and chloroquine and all that so maybe the impact of the virus may not be strong on nigeria but we need data to prove that and the only way we can get that data is by testing so i think that what is facing us today is lack of state capacity we need our state governments to rise up every morning and tell us the status. What do we know? What does our teaching hospitals know? What does our um, institutes know? How many people that have been tested? Have we tried to test for antibodies? To see maybe whether this virus has been with us since January. I don't believe that all the Igbo traders who went to China in December, who went to Wuhan, did not bring back this virus as, late, as early as December, January. I don't buy it. I believe that this virus has been somewhere in the south is far longer than we know now that's my own take but we don't know we need to test so i totally support the idea that we test and for the soludo's view i also say that we should all be more tentative we need to restart we cannot sustain this but let's be a little more tentative in making sure that we are restarting without spreading because spreading is going to be very very traumatic in, in a country like nigeria Okay, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, I think we'll take la one more last question, and that question is coming from Chris, uh, Honorable Chris Anubog, uh, Azubog, sorry. So, Chris, over to you. Hello. Thank you very much. 
So do you have a question? Uh, you raised your hand. So do yes, you have uh, yes, I, I have a little bit of suggestion to what Usi said about the airport. Um, basically, River State, uh, Patakot Airport carries both uh, cargo and uh, passenger. But we have, in a way, an international cargo, Samba, that can be easily used to receive cargo for Southeast. Mm -hmm. It's very important that we can. And South Eora is very aptly located that it can serve good South East, South South. It can let, I mean, we can move goods from Oare to up to Calabar, uh, uh, Fire Bomb, Rivers, Faisa, everywhere. Oare Airport is strategic and is the heartland of uh, South East. So it can serve both South South and South. And it's an international cargo airport. It can obviously cargo, uh, 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 cargo crafts landing in Oare. So we can actually get federal government. And between the governors of uh, uh, governor of Imo State and federal government, I think at least a bit okay. So if we suggest that, there's some sort of we can receive the PPEs and the test kits and everything. The truth is that we need to make haste and start proper comprehensive and massive testing in the Southeast. It's important that we receive all the needed equipment for us to start testing in the Southeast. Like you mentioned, it is obvious that we are more exposed to the challenges of uh, COVID. Mm -hmm. COVID-19 than we have seen. We must do a lot of testing for us to be able to ensure if the occurrences are as low as we have, we are being reported. See what happened in Kandu. When you don't do proper testing, even Abuja, somewhere in Mabushi, behind the Ministry of War, because there's a slum there, what we have seen in the last few days is horrifying, very horrific. So it's important that we increase our ability to test. So if we need to receive test kit from all over the world, so we can do a lot of testing. Then an issue of uh, closing comprehensively. Um, we have the opinion that the entire surface panel will not be totally closed. Like you said, we must make sure that we observe all the needed, uh, take all the needed measures, but don't allow, not cripple our economy because we are mostly an in, in informal sector where people need to go out on a daily basis for them to earn a living. So we are going to be considerate in whatever we do. And we can also use it as opportunity to simulate growth. So these are the things that I, I feel that uh, OSI can look at when this. Uh, but I, I'm in support of what he has said. We shall we choose our data and everything. But when I contribute my own, then we'll have the other perspective. But okay. I'm talking um, to OSI on the show of the airport. Thank you. Okay. So, Honorable uh, Azubogu, I'll put this question to you. You rightly yes. said that the Southeast can actually. Um, I wouldn't use the word upsurge, but at least the result is can actually take the traffic that ought to go to Portacourt if Wike says no. Now, the question is, if that is common sense and is available knowledge to everybody, why are the governors of the Southeast or why is the governor of Imo State not uh, in the forefront championing yes. this? Yes. The truth is that uh, when it comes about knowledge or information or understanding of situation and circumstances, if somebody who is strategically positioned does not present such a situation, like if we have a conversation now, yes, because we're in a, in a very, in a, in a crisis situation, a lot of people, things can uh, elude some people. They might not know that this thing is possible. But the issue is that we are not calling for passenger aircraft. We're talking of cargo flights coming into the country. And if you are looking at easy logistics for Southeast and South South, or is properly designated as a cargo airport, not mostly for passengers. Um, let me, correct, let, me, let me correct an information. Um, um, Honorable Owere has been called an cargo airport, but there is there are conditions precedent cool. that hasn't been concluded. Exactly. So okay. are, that needs to be concluded before where it can become an international cargo airport. Those things have not been completed. Um, they were ongoing um, from Tel Odua's time, from my time, but they are slowed down. But the work is going on partly, but it's not yet and it cannot even operate night flights. So, as it is today, with special permission, international flights may land there with special permission. But if there are big flights, like a 777 or anything bigger than the 8310, it won't be able to go to where, um, as at now. So, where is still um, not yet on the international radar as an international airport. Uh, I just want to add that. Yes, but we, in principle, the government has given approval for where to become an international cargo airport, but it's still there are still conditions precedent to that happening. Okay, thank, thank you. you very much. So thank you, you very much. We're in a crisis situation. Yeah, we're in a crisis, so we can always um, make amends and see how we can 
utter it. The, the critical thing is that and the South South, and I think Wike is getting the point. I mean, he, his initial attitude was that the oil companies should not violate the lockdown. But now, I think he's getting the point that, yes, they shouldn't violate it, but he should allow the essential equipment to come in. But for the Southeast governors, I think we will be in the forefront of moving for logistics to be back on track because the major logistics, informal logistics companies are owned by Southeasterners. We are the hub of by logistics. In them. So we, the Southeast is very strong in goods logistics. Why the North is very strong in petroleum logistics? All the tankers that you see operating in the downstream sector are mostly owned by Northerners. And the Northerners, yeah. you notice, they own a lot of tankers. And just by way of um, some history, the reason why that is prevalent in Nigeria was that in the 1960s, in 1962, the Nigerian railways went on strike and there was no way to move Grand North from Kanu down to the port. So the government of the North took a decision and funded Northern businessmen to start buying trucks to move the Grand North from the North down to the sea port. That is the origin of Northern dominance of college in terms of trucking business. So every crisis is an opportunity. This opportunity has again arisen. This is the time for us to get ABC, GIG, and all these companies again to become very critical to Nigerians um, logistics backbone, especially for the purpose of bringing in equipment, testing, and growth. Uh, just, just like, uh, can okay. I say something I see? Yes. Yeah, I see, uh, just like we said, if the bigger aircraft moving commodities or essentials into Lagos and Abuja, Yes. Other aircraft can move because of the challenges we're having. Yes. Goods into Owe for yes. Southeast. Because yes. we need those equipment. We need the PPEs for the health centers, for for health workers. For it. it is for us to ask for it because there are yeah. no aircraft waiting to go anywhere now. So somebody has to demand for these things. We have to get, um, if we're going to pay airpiece to move it. I don't like this idea of us turning airpiece into a for the Christmas for Nigeria. No, that can be. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much uh, for the contribution. So I'm not going to take my